Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen, and I'm an educator and a National Geographic Explorer, and I will be your host for today's show. At National Geographic, we believe anyone, and we mean anyone, can be an explorer, and that you have the power to make a difference in the world, no matter how old you are. Explorer Classroom is here to inspire you with stories from the field and to connect you with our National Geographic Explorers live to answer your questions. Before we get into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome some classes who are joining us today, especially our Miho, Rio Grande, and Discovery Elementary Schools, Colebrook High School, Parkway Northeast Middle School, El Dorado PS, Escuelo Tribu Viva, Thomas Jefferson Middle, Tidewater, Rogers Hall, and the Far Core Homeschool. Today, our explorer is Moriba Ja. Moriba is a space environmentalist who studies astrodynamics. This is also the movement of objects in space. He specializes in detecting, tracking, and identifying and characterizing objects that are in orbit around our Earth. He splits his time between Makuau in Hawaii on the island of Maui and in his home in Austin, Texas. There, he is an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas, Austin. He is also the chief scientist and a co-founder of Privateer, a data and intelligence platform focused on empowering the future of space sustainability. He developed a tool for this called Wayfinder. This tracks satellites and space debris like old satellites, rockets, and other man-made objects that have ended up around our Earth. He does this in an effort to understand what is the clutter orbiting our planet and how could this clutter impact our future? We are so excited to have Moriba here with us today. He's going to tell us all about his work, what he does to make space safe, secure, and sustainable. Moriba, welcome to Explore Classroom. So students, we just learned about the word orbit. We learned that there is satellites, but also clutter and debris on a repeated path going around an object in space. And for Moriba's work, that's Earth. So now we know that there are many objects in orbit around our planet. Did you know that? Did you think it was just empty? So now we want to hear from you. We are going to take a look at Moriba's work on Wayfinder. This is a tool. Moriba created this tool and it tracks various objects in Earth's orbit. Now, you are looking at Earth right now, and all of those tiny dots are different objects that Moriba's team has found. They are orbiting our planet right now. Moriba is going to tell us what these objects are in a moment, but let's hear from you first. You might notice that there are different colored dots. There's pink, blue, and white. Each color represents a different type of object. Students, our question for you is, what do you think the objects are? Students, if you could tell your teachers and adults, they can type them into our chat bar. We wanna know your best guesses. Again, what do you think are these tiny objects currently orbiting our planet? Hmm, what could it be? Oh, I see lots of thinking faces. Hmm, all right. Far Core Homeschool says we think it's garbage. Miss Beckett's class says satellites. Mrs. Drew's class says debris from rocket ships. Hmm, what else? What are you thinking? Let's get a few more answers. 
Escuela Tribu Viva says they're communication satellites. Mrs. Rivera's dolphin says space rocks, meteors, or broken satellite parts. Another classmate at Escuela Tribu Viva says parts of a rocket booster, like the one that came off Apollo. Mm, Hoffman Boston's all-stars say satellites. Let's see what our YouTubers are saying. Ellen says it's dust and rocks and little asteroids. Emily says the white dots are going to be broken bits of metal. Hmm, these have been great guesses, but lucky for us, we don't have to go on forever just wondering. We have an expert who made the software here with us. So I'm gonna pass the controls over to Moriba and he's going to tell us what are we looking at and what do these little colors mean? Awesome. So thanks again. Uh, I loved seeing all the guesses. And guess what? Your guesses were actually pretty spot on. So that's awesome. Looks like you know a lot about these things already. And yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this website and I'm going to walk you through some of these things. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Let's see. Here we go. So hopefully you can all see Wayfinder again. This is pretty cool tool that uh, I developed. And every single dot is a human-based object that is currently orbiting the Earth. I'm going to include the rocket bodies. I'm going to include the debris. And you can see how much junk there is. So we're looking at um, you know, roughly about 9,600 things that are working. And everything else is trash. The pink things are things that we really don't know if they're a fragment or if they're a rocket body or just a dead satellite. Um, so, so, so that's the uncategorized. The inactive satellites, these are whole intact satellites that just ran out of fuel and, or stopped working for some reason, but are still on these orbital highways. The rocket bodies, those are the things that transport these satellites into orbit. And wow, there's a lot of them that are still up there. Ever since we started launching satellites since 1957, I think a little bit before some of you were born. And uh, so we still have like 2000 of those uh, orbiting the earth. And these things are the sizes of school buses. That's pretty large. And then the rest of the things that are called debris, these are fragments. So uh, sometimes when these satellites get old and they stop working, pieces of these satellites break off and they become fragments. Sometimes two objects meet at the same place at the same time and they collide. And in that collision, they become many, many, many other pieces. So here I'm zooming into uh, Texas, where I, I'm currently in Austin, and we can see information about some of these satellites as they're moving, as they're orbiting. We can paint one of these orbits. And uh, as we paint the orbit, you can see this line. So this line is showing the actual orbital path in space for that object. It's a few hundred kilometers or a few hundred miles above, above the Earth's surface. And really, you know, one of the things that many people think is that things in space float because there's no gravity, but that's not true. Actually, there's a lot of gravity and things in orbit are just things that are always falling towards the Earth, but they're moving at such high speeds horizontally that they keep on missing the Earth. So you can kind of see some of these orbital highways and this one that you see at the outer edge, that ring is called the geosynchronous ring where it takes about 24 hours for a satellite to go around once. So it's a perfect place for communication satellites. The peak ring that you see here, uh, which is like an ellipse, that pink ring was started from what I call a super spreader event. When COVID happened, we, we heard about super spreader events, you know, people going to, many people being in the same place at the same time and, 
you know, COVID spreading. Well, this is one rocket body. One of those 2000 rocket bodies exploded a few years ago. And all those pink dots came from a single rocket body. So it shows you how quickly something, one thing can cause so much pollution in outer space. I wanna also show you that things closer to the planet are called low earth orbiting satellites. And as we zoom out, we go into mid earth orbit satellites. And then that ring called geosynchronous is that at that edge. And just to give you a better picture before I open it up to uh, more, more sorts of questions and more exchange, here on the left-hand side is a snapshot of about 4,000 of these objects. The color code is based on how their orbits are inclined with respect to the Earth's equator. So something that's orbiting around the Earth's equator is zero degrees inclination. Something going around the poles is 90 degrees inclination. But then these same 4,000 objects, I'm going to be a bit nerdy, and I basically mapped these things into a different space called angular momentum space. And you can see these rings. And these are the highways that I'm talking about. Things on the bottom are low Earth orbit. Things in the middle are mid Earth orbit. And things on top, this halo on top, represent these geosynchronous objects. And you can kind of see that these things look like rings or highways. Those are the highways that I'm actually talking about. Wait, so let me get this straight. There are things orbiting our Earth all the time, and some of them are going really fast, and they're the size of a school bus? That's absolutely correct. Some of them are the size of the school bus, and many of them are the size of SUVs. So when you say you want to keep space safe and secure and sustainable, that's what you're talking about. You're protecting the satellites that are working and protecting us from that pollution. Kids, friends, this is so interesting. Did you know this? So we just learned about all the different types of objects that are in orbit at different levels around our planet. Um, they're on these highways. And we learned that one of the most common objects is a satellite. There are thousands of man-made satellites. Some of them are taking pictures of our planet. Some of them are taking pictures of, of other planets, um, the sun, other objects in space. And these pictures can help scientists learn about the Earth and our solar system and our universe. But other satellites send us TV signals and help us make phone calls all around the world. So we want to hear from you again. Students, our question for you is, can you think of something that you use daily or frequently that rely on satellites? I wonder if you're aware. Students, tell your teachers your answer. Um, teachers and adults, you can type them into the chat. Again, what is something you use every day or frequently that requires satellites to work? I'll share you with you an example from my life. So yesterday I drove to a building that I do not drive to often. And I was kind of confused thinking about what roads, what highways. So on an app on my phone, I opened a map up. I plugged in the address of where I was going, and I got real-time directions that navigated me around traffic. How did it know? It's because satellites were sending my tiny phone information in my little car. Meet me. What about you? What are some things that you use all the time that require satellites? All right, let's look at some of us. Let's see... <laughs> All right, Hoffman Boston All Stars say we use our school iPads, FaceTime, the internet, and games. I'm assuming video games. Mrs. Rivera's Dolphins say GPS, our phones and computers. Ms. Drew's class also says the internet, but added Google Maps. That's what I was using yesterday. Farcor says their phones. Ms. Beckett's class says their TVs. Escuela Tribu Viva says Wi-Fi and Zoom for my classes and our cell phones. Let's see, anything else? All right, how many of you ever go shopping online? You buy something online, it gets delivered to your house. 
that requires satellites? What about when someone's flying in to visit you and you want to check to see if their plane has landed? Yep, that requires satellites too, even social media. Yeah, even like posting a photo of you at your grandpa's birthday on social media, that requires satellites. Let's see what some of our YouTubers have said. Susanna says, my smart appliances. I saw the smartest refrigerator recently. It told you the weather. I just wanted ice, but it told me the weather. Uh, anything you can get at Best Buy. You're right, Susanna. Anything at Best Buy, except maybe the chip bags. I don't know. Maybe somehow satellites are connected. Well, thank you so much for sending us your answers, everybody. You are right. Satellites make it possible for us to watch live broadcasts on TV, like when a lot of us were watching the Super Bowl in America. We use maps on our phones, like how to find the post office closest to your school. We can even forecast the weather so that we know what clothing we should wear to school this day. So thank you for all of that. Mora, but it seems that like everything we have sent into space um, likely had a purpose, but those things that break down or die, as you said, um, they're just there. So what are the consequences of having so much debris in outer space? You know, that's a great question. And I want to thank everybody for sending all of their kind of ideas about how space influences their lives. They're, they're all right. Absolutely. And yeah, it is, it's pretty sad that uh, because of the physics and how things move in space, these things stay up there for a very long time, sometimes forever, uh, unless we go up and clean them, which we're not doing. And so once these things, you know, stop working, they still go at these very high speeds. And as you said, they were, you know, fulfilling a purpose, but now they're getting in the way. And the thing is, satellites that we care about they're not protected from getting hit by the pieces of garbage. So that's the danger is that all these things that people have been listing in terms of being able to have smart refrigerators, Best Buy, sending pictures across the globe, internet, um, even being able to monitor the earth for climate change, weather, helping with agriculture and all these things, we know more about ourselves as a humanity and, and as a planet because of these robots in the sky that we call satellites than by any other source of information. And these things just aren't protected from being damaged by a piece of junk. And then we lose that capability. Imagine if we couldn't go to the bank and get our money or if our internet stopped working, that would be a very, very horrible day, which we'd like to avoid. So we actually need to do something about the garbage in space. Well, are there any solutions? I mean, I I don't know of any work that's currently cleaning it up. What do you think? Yeah, so interestingly enough, there are groups of countries and people that gather at the United Nations. The, the United Nations has an office of outer space affairs in Vienna and Austria, and they just met a few weeks ago to talk about these issues. So people are at least discussing it, but there has been no satellite yet that has been like an orbiting garbage truck that has gone and picked up anything. So we're waiting for governments to get their act together and start looking at cleaning space so that we don't put ourselves in a position to lose these awesome services and capabilities. I agree with you. And it sounds like maybe some of our young explorers out there, you can start thinking about ways. So Moraba just shared some thoughts about how his work keeps space safe, secure, and sustainable. Ooh, that's a lot of S's. Space that is safe, secure, sustainable. Say that three times fast. But we want to hear from you one last time. So our question is, do you already have creative ideas? I bet you do. What are your creative ideas to help clean up this area around our earth in space? Students, could you tell your teachers what your ideas are? And who knows, maybe uh, you get a little bit older and you can get a grant with Moriba and you can help clean up our atmosphere. What are some ideas you have? Put your answers in the chat with your adult and we're going to read them aloud.
Mrs. B's class says, just go clean it. Well, that's true. I know that I can clean my house with a vacuum. That's how I get the cat hair. Maybe a space vacuum of sorts. Miss Drew's class says, if the waste continues to build up, it might block the sun. Yeah, you're right. So we need some solutions. What are we going to do to help clean up this space debris? Anyone got some ideas? Remember, they're, they're big pieces out there. What can you do to clean up these big pieces? Mm, I see lots of thinking on going on. Hmm. Ah, Mrs. Rivera's dolphins say, we think that if we recycle the garbage from space, it will help clear things up and including that airspace. Yeah. Mrs. Beckett's class make a big space vacuum. Hmm. What about a robot? Miss Drew's class says a robot that can go into space and pick it up. Our friend Jew says something magnetic. Oh, that came from Colebrook. Something magnetic. Yeah, if a lot of these things are made of metal. Farcor says send it to a black hole. Escuela Tribu Viva says send a large satellite with a magnetic field and then draw those pieces back to Earth. Let's check out what our friends are saying on YouTube. Hmm. Ooh, Susanna says, why don't we clean up our space junk before we go explore other parts? Ellen says, try to slow down rockets. Yeah, maybe the rockets could pick things up on their way. Susanna also says, robots with a grabber arm. Friends, you are thinking like an aerospace engineer. I love the concepts of recycling, using magnets, using robots. All of these are great ideas. Thank you. More about what do you think about some of these innovative ideas? Absolutely. So here's 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 the thing. Um, a lot of them are really spot on tickety boo, as I like to say. Uh, certainly, um, some of the things in space could be magnetic, so that could work for a few things. The robots with the grappling arm, in fact. The European Space Agency has already thought about that. There's something called Clear Space. They're going to launch this satellite uh, next year to go grab a piece of debris and bring it back and have it like burn up in the atmosphere. Um, the recycling is such a key thing. Um, one of the things that I've been talking to governments about is instead of designing satellites to be single use, which they are right now, just like single use plastics, we don't want those sorts of things because that turns into garbage. What if we design satellites to be reusable and recyclable? Then we wouldn't have to launch as many things. And so that is a fabulous idea. So all of this stuff is really good. Uh, the black hole, uh, maybe not so much because look, the, the black hole doesn't discriminate. We don't want us sucking the earth up in it either, right? But uh, But yes, all these ideas are really, really, really great. So. I love it. I love how I'm I'm getting all these celestial stewards uh, to come forth. Remember, if you write a paper, you need to citate all of us who are a part of today. Make sure all the kids get to be involved. All right. Well, thank you, students, for sharing your idea with us. And thank you, Moraba, for joining us today with your incredible work. I think it's time for Q&A. Are you ready for some questions? All right, if you are watching online, send your questions into the chat bar. We record them as you send them in. So please only send your question once. And teachers, adults, tell us who is asking the question and what part of the world you are coming in from. We'd love to give you a geographic shout out. We have a question from a YouTuber named Brandon. Brandon is coming in from, I think, Connecticut. Brandon wants to know, how do you get pictures of where the space debris is and which direction it's orbiting or moving? Yeah, great question. So back to one of the things that I said, if you want to know something, you have to measure it. If you want to understand something, you have to predict it. So prediction is the key. So we use radars and telescopes. So we don't get actual pictures of satellites. We just get uh you know, energy being reflected off of these satellites. And they pretty much look like dots to us in the radars and telescopes. 
based on the evidence that we get, what we try to do is we try to make assumptions about how the thing is moving so that then we can predict where it's gonna be. And then we take some more measurements and we compare the difference between what we observe and what we predict. And that difference we call an error. And based on the error, we try to learn to make our predictions better and better and better. And Taicho wants to know, with all this metal in space, how does it become scattered everywhere? Yeah, so the thing is, these orbital highways that I that I showed, um, they crisscross each other. And so part of the scattering is things breaking up on their own over time as satellites age. Other parts of the scatter are if things like these rocket bodies explode and become tens of thousands of pieces. And another part of the scatter is if two things collide with each other and become many thousands of pieces. So that's that's what contributes towards the scattering. Wow. And you know, more about, we've done some shows recently about plastic pollution. Is plastic pollution a problem in space like it is here in our oceans? So I would say um, we don't have a plastic problem like the oceans in space, but the same way in which plastics have polluted the oceans, human activity in space has polluted space. And in fact, um, Imogen Knapper, she's another Nat Geo explorer. Yeah, so her and I have collaborated on these things because they're very, uh, they're very similar problems, the space debris and the ocean debris. Wow. Well, everyone, you've been asking such amazing questions, but we're getting towards the end of our show. So Moraba, do you have time for one more, please? Absolutely. So my question, I hope benefits everybody. Do you have a final message for all of the future and current explorers watching today? Absolutely. Uh, I would say that, you know, people say, what's the hardest part of solving these problems? And I tell them it's not technical, it's not political, it's a lack of empathy. And empathy is our ability to project ourselves into the perspectives of others. And I think the most important thing for all you explorers is to embrace and believe in the interconnectedness amongst all things, to see yourselves as stewards of the planet, as caretakers and custodians of yourselves and of your communities, and behave as stewards, and try to find ways to get yourselves and other people to feel empathy towards Spaceship Earth. And if you can do that, look, uh, I firmly believe that we can turn things around. It's always good to know that there's hope. And it sounds like not only do you have a lot of hope in your work, but you also have a lot of joy. I'm just curious, those of you watching, if you feel like you have more empathy for our current situation right outside of the earth in space, can you give a satellite wave that you now are more aware and you're paying more attention? Look at all those hands. Well, we start right here, don't we, Moriba? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for coming and joining us today, sharing your heart, your expertise, and thank you so much for that final message about empathy. You know, I'm just trying to recruit more celestial stewards. That's right. Also, to all of our celestial stewards, students and adults and teachers out there, thank you so much for your thoughtful questions. Of course, also thank you teachers for bringing your class to today's show. It's been an exciting season so far for Explorer Classroom. It feels like every week there's something new and engaging, but we've still got so much more ahead. So please check out our event schedule. You can register for events at natgeoed.org backslash Explorer Classroom. And when you register, you can request a chance to be on screen, like many of our guests were today. Next Thursday, we'll be back on our Thursday schedule, and we will be joined by explorer Deanne Shiros. Her research focuses on harnessing the power of biology. Hmm, do you know biology? It's a study of life. So she harnesses the power of biology to create clothing and other materials sustainably. 
Please join us next week to learn how she fuses science and fashion by turning microbes into a textile. Have a great day, everyone. Stay curious. Keep exploring. 